listening to the Read Aloud Revival Podcast. This is the podcast that inspires you to build your family culture around books. Hello there, Sarah McKenzie here. You know what this is? This is a bonus episode of the Read Aloud Revival Podcast. We plan out and schedule our podcast pretty far in advance so we can make every episode as good as possible for you and worth every second of your time. But every so often, I get way too excited about a podcast episode to make it wait its turn in our podcast queue. And that shows up as a bonus podcast. Today is such a day. It's going to be a great show. We're talking to Melissa Sweet about her brand new book, Some Writer, The Story of E.B. White. I am so excited about this book because I think E.B. White is one of the finest writers of children's books, one of the finest writers of all time. Mom to mom, I want to give you a little heads up on this one. The book is gorgeous and wonderful, but do peek at page 46 before you launch into it or hand the book over to your kids so you can decide what you want to do with that paragraph in the middle of the page. You know your kids and family best, but I wanted to give you a heads up so that paragraph doesn't catch you by surprise. The book is fantastic. The illustrations and mixed media collages are spectacular. Let's go talk to Melissa to find out how she made this work of art. Now, before we launch into today's interview, I want to let you know that later this week, we are posting the brand new 2017 Read Aloud Revival calendar that shows everything we've got happening in membership in 2017. If you've been following along on Facebook or Instagram, you know a lot of the authors that we have lined up. Authors like Patricia Polacco, Andrew Peterson, Tommy DePaola, <laughs> all kinds of spectacular authors and illustrators who will be joining us and your kids can meet them face to face inside Read Aloud Revival membership, type in their questions, get their questions answered live on screen by the author or illustrator himself or herself. It's going to be a fantastic year. We have some other surprises we haven't shared yet. So if you want to know what's happening in 2017, get on the email list now so that you get that email and that heads up as soon as our calendar is available. Go to rarmembership.com and put your email in there. Not only will we email you as soon as we've got that calendar and news about what's coming in membership, but we'll also send you access to the Andrew Clements Author Access event. That's something we gave just to our members last year. Andrew Clements, of course, is the amazing writer of Frindle and a gazillion other wonderful books. But we are sharing that one with everybody because it was really fantastic. You'll find out all kinds of things like what a Frindle is and Andrew Clements' favorite Frindles to use. (laughs) It was a fun day. Anyway, go to RAR, that's like Read Aloud Revival, rarmembership.com and put your email in there and you'll find out all the great stuff we've got coming just around the bend. Many of us are quick to name our favorite children's authors, but so often the artists who illustrated those books are what we really recognize on the shelf. So today we have quite a treat for you. Melissa Sweet is an award-winning illustrator who recently published a biography of the one and only E.B. White, that infamous author of some of the best children's lit in history, Charlotte's Web, Stuart Little, Trumpet of the Swan. Melissa Sweet has illustrated nearly 100 picture books and nonfiction titles, books like the Baby Bear series, written by Jane Yolen, the Pinky and Rex series, The Boy Who Drew Birds, Brave Girl, goodness, the list goes on and on and on. She's received a Caldecott Honor Medal and two New York Times Best Illustrated Citations. And she's also the author of books like Balloons Over Broadway and the new book we're going to be talking about today, Some Writer, The Story of E.B. White. Melissa, thank you so much for joining me on the show today. Thank you, Sarah. I'm thrilled to be here. And you just said something. You said the one and only E.B. White, and that would have been a great title for the book, wouldn't it? <laughs> yes, but that some writer was so clever. I mean, it's yes, just such a clever was good, but, but that would have been a good subtitle even. So th- I'm happy to hear that. Thanks. Well, I was just, you know, I found out about your book because I was just cruising around looking at kids' books like I do on the internet. And when I saw that you were coming out with a new book by E.B. White, I knew I had to get in touch with you. And it's brand new. Just came out last week when we're airing this on October 11th. It just came out on the 4th, right? Correct. So before we launch into talking about E.B. White and the book and how you make your books, do you want to tell us just a little bit more about you and 
how you work and your dog. <laughs> oh, sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, sure. I have been illustrating for a very long time. And somewhere in the middle of my career, I started doing more collage and assemblage work. Always the books are very different. But I was beginning to get more than picture books, nonfiction books or historical fiction. And those seem to call for something else. So for a number of years now, I've been doing wonderfully fun and intricate type of collage work. And I live in Portland, Maine. We just moved to Portland and I have two really great dogs. One's a rescue from the Hurricane Katrina down in Louisiana. Oh, and she's that. so sweet. Yeah, she's a very sweet thing. And then we just got a great new dog named Ruby who so when I'm not in the studio, we're getting exercise. Yeah, that's, I bet you are. <laughs> that's, that's what my life looks like, right? That's yeah. so great. So then tell me, because your books are this beautiful combination of drawing and painting, right? My, I was kind of like flipping through the ones that I have here, trying to figure out exactly the, all the different mediums that you use. And then, of course, this gorgeous collage work that you do. So tell me a little bit about the different art forms you use when you make a book? The collage work started off using found objects, bottle caps and little bits of wood and shells and anything that seemed pertinent to the story. So it's safe to say it really went full tilt when I did The Boy Who Drew Birds about John James Audubon. Mm -hmm. Part of it happened with the research because that was the first time I traveled to see someplace in conjunction with getting ready to illustrate a book. And father had a house in Mill Grove, Pennsylvania that became a tourist. Uh, it's open to the public, I should say. So I went there to see his studio bedroom, the gigantic prints of his watercolors that are there, and just the accoutrements of his life. That is, to my mind, hard to translate in two dimensions. So I thought, wow. When I'm going to recreate what I think the desk of his studio might look like. So I had desiccated animals and bits of bones and shells and leaves and sticks and anything I thought, little bits of drawing, just like my studio. And it seemed to bring him to life for readers in a way that was really satisfying, that you felt what it might have felt like to be him. So that continued on. When I did Balloons Over Broadway, the main character, Tony Sarg, the man who invented the Macy's Prey Balloons, he's nothing like Audubon. So what should those materials look like? And in that case, I made paper mache puppets and used wood and very simple materials, old children's blocks, to make a bunch of toys that I was going to photograph for the book. Or I have photographed, I should say. I don't do the photography, but my work is very three-dimensional, like three-dimensional assemblages. So they get photographed. In conjunction with the three-dimensional pieces, there's flat pieces. So I'll do a painting of in, for a spread, for two dimensions, and that becomes merged with the three-dimensional pieces in the book. And we have some very talented people in the production department who make it feel seamless because it could look very chopped up, mm -hmm. but... And it looks like one person did it and it's all, the, it, feel, it has the same feeling and not only in the textures and materials, but in the color and the way it's reproduced. Oh, it's so, so beautiful. That, I really that. feel like the pages jump out at you. Like you could spend a lot of time just looking at each page. And like you said, it looks seamless. It's just astounding how beautiful. Yeah. It kind of takes you by surprise. Every time you turn the page, you think, what am I, it's like a surprise. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. And just to reiterate too, not every book calls for the same materials and not every book calls for collage at all. Sometimes a purely painted book is the right solution to portray this material. So I spend quite a bit of time thinking about that and playing around with that before I settle in on how I'm going to begin. Wow. Okay. So I think the first encounter I had with your art was probably those Eboo counting card or counting yeah. birds wall cards. I ran into those on a little weekend getaway I went on with my husband, and I had to grab them for our schoolroom. We homeschool our kids, and I had to put them up because they are so beautiful. And then I thought, I need to find this artist online and discovered that you had illustrated Jane Yolen's books. And then, of course, the John James Audubon book was something that we had, I already had on my shelf. So I just put the, uh, putting it all together, I thought, oh my goodness, this is beautiful. So when you get a new project to work on, you're saying that you basically take 
you just kind of play with it for a little bit to decide exactly what medium is going to tell the best story. Is that what you're kind of saying? Yes. And the research, especially for instance, a nonfiction book Mm -hmm. will help me dictate. I'll, I'll, I'll read and see uh, bits of people's lives that I think could be incorporated into the collages. I did a book with Jen Bryant, the author Jen Bryant, the title's A Splash of Red, yes. the story of Horace Pippin. So that was a very different book because that he's an artist. The trick is not to become Horace Pippin, not to mimic his type of art, but to look for clues within the art. So what I found about his work, for instance, was there was a flattened perspective. And he used a lot of pattern, especially wood grain pattern. Also, there were tiny splashes of the color red. Those were my clues. And that's how the book began. That's true of every book. And that's part of the fun of it, though, is is really honing in on and finding the exact right recipe for beginning the art. And that's what makes each one unique. And that's and fresh and just a lot of fun to make. That's so fun. So do you work with a lot of the same authors over and over? Does it seem I know I've noticed that you've you've worked with Jane Yolen and Jane Yolen is actually going to be featured at the Reload Revival. We're going to introduce her face to face with our community in an author access event in 2017. Super excited about that. But do you find yourself working a lot with the same authors or does that just constantly change or how does that work? That changes from year to year. Sometimes, for instance, with Jane, we did the Baby Bears books together and then I just did a fourth with her, You Nest Here With Me, written by Jane and her daughter, Heidi. But And then Jen Bryant and I did three books together. More often, though, it's one book together, one book per author. And for whatever reason, we go on to the next thing. But that marriage of author and illustrator happens within the publishing house. I mean, an author couldn't say, I'd love to work with so-and-so mm-hmm. if they're available. And sometimes we're just not available. There's a probably a short list of who could illustrate this book. But I think because each book is so different for each author, they look to have that marriage be special and carry the material through in a new way. So I think it's very careful. I've read that even as a child, you loved art. And we have a lot of listeners to the podcast, young listeners in the families that listen to our podcast who yeah. are aspiring writers and illustrators. In fact, I have a aspiring children's book illustrator in my own home who's 12 years old and wants to grow up to write or illustrate children's books. I'm just curious to know about how your love for art as a child, how did that grow into what you're doing now as an adult? Maybe you could tell that story for our young listeners. Sure. Well, I grew up in... New Jersey, where we were on our bicycles all day and played kick the can at night. We had a big crowd of kids in our neighborhood. We had a wonderful public library and we used to ride our bikes to the library and come home with books. But to be honest, I wasn't such a great reader. I loved books, but not that wasn't my go to place. I always wanted to be making things. My mom was a great sewer. My grandmother was constantly doing crafty stuff. My father did carpentry, so having tools and glue and construction paper was all around me. And also I had a lot of kits, and I'm sure these kits, it's almost like it's almost like the pieces from that I do for Ibu are an extension of my childhood, the matching games and and all those the wonderful puzzles and gorgeous pieces she'd come out of Ibu were a little bit like when I was a kid and I played with Spirograph and Etch a Sketch and Paint by Numbers. So those toys are really design tools. And they taught me a tremendous amount. They occupied my unending energy that I had as a kid. So I think it was... That you probably still wish you had, right? If you're anything like me. (laughs) I think that they were very satisfying. It's very satisfying to play with a spirograph. So I had a lot of fun doing that. When it came to... I never really thought I'd be anything but an artist. It was after college discovering that I loved painting and drawing best, that I was just looking for ways to portray my art, doing anything, uh, greeting cards. You know, I was, I understood that an artist had to be entrepreneurial. So I was looking for ways to do that. And I loved children's books. The children's book illustration in the late eighties was kind of a renaissance. I think the printing process had changed and we were seeing 
David McCauley and Chris Van Ellsberg and a lot of wonderful people just come in onto the scene that we're making these books that just look like nothing else. Yeah. So that's a little bit how it happened. David and McCauley I, has a special place in my heart. We just chatted with him at Read Aloud Revival in membership, introduced him to the kids. He did an author access event for us last weekend. And he like sketched, showed us how he did his sketches and how he drew the woolly mammoth on screen live and then sent me the sketches in the mail. It was like I went and wow. checked my mailbox and I think <laughs> I had, could not wipe the smile off. But my husband is building a frame for it. That's how excited I was. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, that is very that. Yeah, I, I would too. <laughs> He's such a man. He is like such a great man. I just yeah, it was such a treat to meet him. So and his work is really astonishing. So yeah, yeah, it truly is. Okay, so you do lots of biographies, which I love how you tell the story of a person that makes it really come alive. I mean, this is what I think history really should do for our kids, which is tell a story of a person in time and the world around them and make it come alive for them so they can really feel like what it might have been to live there. But you've written a book, and I just got this one because I hadn't seen it before, The Right Word, which is a story about the man behind Roget's thesaurus. Well, Roget. And his thesaurus, that's the subtitle. You said A Splash of Red, which is a book about Horace Pippin, Brave Girl. And of course, this new one about E.B. White, Balloons Over Broadway, about the man behind the Macy's Day Parade. So tell me, how do you choose who to write about when you're writing a biography or illustrating a biography? Almost all of those books that you just listed came to me from other authors. And I again, I, I'm guessing it came from my work in The Boy Who Drew Birds. Yes, okay. Uh, so publishers find, found me, and working with Jen Bryant on, we did a book, A River of Words, the story of William Carlos Williams, the poet. That was a very interesting project and probably a defining moment. There were big shoes to fill. Mm-hmm. And so you look at these people and wonder how can you portray them with the magnet, to reflect the magnitude of what they've done with their life. and. With William Carlos Williams, and not unlike E.B. White, it's a little bit intimidating to find the right formula of how to illustrate their work. So one thing that happened around that time was I was participating in my public library. There was an event around making altered books. So we, I had this big box of books in my studio that was slated for the landfill. You know, once a library has a big book sale, the books and the books just don't sell for the third time. They get a lot of them they get thrown away, but we were looking to give these books to artists and have them come up with all different ways of, you know, repurposing or up, um, what's the word? Upcycling. Upcycling. Thank you. Upcycling. Yeah. Yeah. Books. So I began to use parts of books in my art and that hasn't, that I still love to do that. I use the front of the book covers. I use the end papers. I use the interiors of the book for collages or to paint on top of. So those were some of the things I began to use. And for whatever reason, they fit these biographies really well. That was a, just a great beginning for me. So especially with William Carlos Williams, that took quite a bit of research for me to get to know William Carlos Williams better. I traveled to where he lived and read a ton of his books. The best way to illustrate him, to my mind, was to illustrate the poems that Jen had within the text. Mm. So here's where this lovely dialogue starts to happen with an author. I approached her and said, "What?" You, and the art director too, and said, what if we, instead of illustrating, you know, this, illustrating the story, so to speak, his poems become part of the, part of the story as full page illustrations. That was a very different feeling than coming at it, um, oh, he's running through the woods. Well, is there a poem that talks about that that would also portray that? And do we have to be quite so literal? That happened in my research with E.B. White in early readings, especially his the letters of E.B. White. So Letters of E.B. White is a collection from the time he was a very young boy up until he died. And it's a thick book of his letters. And he had the wherewithal to use carbon paper as a youth, too. When he went out west, he took a cross-country road trip, and all those letters written home and written to his friends were all on carbon paper. So there's a record of them, and that was pretty remarkable. In crafting the story, I knew that E.B. White 
said it so much more eloquently and heartfelt and right from, it was right from him that I had to use his essays and quotes peppered throughout my text to give an even deeper story. In the early reading of the letters of E.B. White, it was evident that to be able to excerpt these letters and use them within the story was going to give readers a better sense of who E.B. White was. Mm, yeah. And and how will a reader know there at one of his essays? So being a visual person, I wanted to separate that out and not just with a different font. So I thought, well, I'm going to type these up on a manual typewriter, just like he would have done. <laughs> and then I'll illustrate them. And that was probably the first thing I thought of that was going to separate me from E.B. White and give the readers a little more depth and insight. So it's kind of exciting when you hit on something like that. That's a decision I stuck with. There's many things are trial and error and I discard, but that was one of them. And then the chapter openers to have these, they're almost in a collage assemblage, the chapter openers. Yeah. They started out with just some hand lettering for the title, but I thought, no, this is such an opportunity to have even more illustration or to set the tone for these chapter openers. And the book is peppered with manuscripts. So again, how does the reader know when they're at an archival piece or a manuscript? Those are all on top of a photograph on top of a very pale green paper. The reader might not say, oh, I'm here I am at this uh, archival piece. But there's a consistency throughout the book, and that becomes part of the design process. So as the illustrator and author, it's not just about making the pictures and writing, and I go back and forth between those all the time, but it's the design. The design helps us marry those two. That and makes that- sense, because when I was reading the book, I never was confused about when you were speaking or when he was speaking. That was always very clear to me, but I didn't stop and think about why that, how I knew that so easily. Good. But you put that's a lot of good. thought into it. <laughs> right. You know? Yeah. Good. Yeah. If it's invisible, that all the better because it, it's not meant to scream. It, it's meant to go down the road, you know, smoothly and not have it be a bumpy road full of potholes. So that's good. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so tell me, what was it like to research this book? Because you wrote and illustrated this book. So I'm sure, I mean, first of all, tell me how long it took you to research and then tell me maybe a little bit about what that was like. Yeah, th- this book took me about three years, maybe more uh, from start from the inception to finished art. And the minute I had the idea and it was just sort of a random idea, I was looking for my next book and I thought, you know, I was wanting to Again, continue to explore how you portray someone's life in the two dimensions of a well, a book is actually three dimensions, but on the two dimensional page. And I thought, wow, if I could do anybody, I who would I do? And E. B. White popped in my head and I was gone. Hook, line, and sinker with questions popping up right away. How did he get to that first line of Charlotte's Web? Was he a good reader as a kid? What kind of kid was he? And of course, what were the names of all of his dogs and all those tiny details that were interesting to me. So I went right home and pulled out that Letters of E.B. White. Working for about a year, trying to figure out his life, I create a timeline on my wall right away and begin to, I'll put up anything, anything, a found object or a post-it note or anything that feels pertinent to the story. I'll start to stick up on my wall in the time frame, you know, from 1899 to 1985 when he lived. And that helps me sort out what happened when. Now, some biographies are an anecdote or a snippet of somebody's life. But early on, in order to tell the story, for instance, of how he got to his three children's books, to my mind, there had to be a lot of backstory. There was so much of his life, his love of nature, his caring for animals, his love of Maine and having a farm all pointed into the direction of where he went. Even Stuart Little living in New York City, um, his granddaughter Martha tells me E.B. White is Stuart Little. So I trust that comes from a good source. Oh, that's too much <laughs> fun. <right>. Okay. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So if there's a lot of, there's always a hundred times more information than we can use. But so a lot of things get 
lost, you know, you have to be set aside. They might be riveting to me, but they don't support the story. So ultimately, this is E.B. White's story. And yes, it's told through my eyes as the biographer, but it's always in service to the story, even though there's things I have to let go of that, to be honest, once I let go of them and just keep honing in on the book, I completely forget what they were even. Why was I so worried about that at the time? But oh, yeah. So, yeah. So you just, you begin to know the quote you picked, the photograph you picked, one picks the art. It all starts to feel just right. Like you're making a jigsaw puzzle. The pieces are fitting together. I love that because the way you talk about it, I can tell that you take it so seriously. This is a, like a, a big task, but you also sound so playful, like putting together a jigsaw puzzle or fiddling around with the different elements of art. So I can hear in your voice when you're talking about it, the joy that you get from making books like this one. Yes, yes. Now, how long did this project take you? This took a good three years. And I was so, boy, I was about a year into this project before I was very public about it. And even then I wasn't tremendously public. I, you know, my husband knew, obviously the publisher knew, but it was almost like I had an uncut diamond sitting on my drafting table that I was so precious that I didn't want too many opinions about it. I didn't want people to say, oh, you've got to include this essay. You've got to include that. Are you going to talk about that? And even I didn't even contact the White family for permissions till about a year in. And I, to be honest, I knew that anybody could write a biography, but I didn't know, <laughs> I should know this, but I didn't know it, that not anybody can have permissions. So to use the archival materials or the photographs had to be granted from the White family. Oh, I didn't know that either. Well, yeah. And I gave her a very slight dummy. My dummies are notoriously cryptic. And because I don't even know what I'm going to be doing. I just have an idea, Mm -hmm. but I have to make a dummy for the publisher. So I have to know where the words are going to go, but I certainly don't know what the art is going to look like. The Let me interrupt ha- you just for a second. You you have to send a dummy to your publisher before you sell the book, before they get behind you. Is that what you're saying? Well, not exactly. Okay. This was we they brought this on the idea alone. Okay. But at a certain point they say we're talking about for instance things like how many pages is it gonna be? So I need so we say, okay, let's start with eighty pages and see how that feels. And so at that point I'll make a dummy. Got it. And yeah, and I'll begin to place the words or, you know, the front why I matter, for instance, the title page and copyright and the back matter, we know we're going to have sources. So it's very rough, but it gives us a sense. I see. I had one of those when Martha White said, let's get together and in my studio and we'll talk further. And I knew Martha slightly because we live in the same town and our paths have crossed and she's been nothing but kind and supportive of my books and her children had my books. So she knew of my work. And she knew of my biographies and the White family was just unbelievably generous. They granted me permissions. She said, sure, I will. And I promise to do a very good job. (laughs) (laughs) But then the wonderful things started happening. Martha said, oh, I've got a scrapbook. I think you should come see. And I said, yes, I would love to see that. She stopped by my studio with some home movies. This was just, it's mesmerizing the privilege it is to be able to have this kind of resource and to know that I can do anything, absolutely anything to portray this author, this beloved author. I have everything at my fingertips. So it was, um, that's how that happened. And once I had access to those materials, I went to Cornell University and looked at all the archival materials, the photographs, his papers and manuscripts And that, again, it's hard to describe the privilege it is and that I get to do this for my work. It personally was not just an education, but a way of looking at the world that I didn't have before. To have the time and resources to delve into E.B. White and his writing, I, I hardly think I would have done it without this book in mind. But yeah, so I grew as an artist and author from the chance to do this book. That's amazing. So there's three books E.B. Wright wrote. Of course, we've got Stuart Little, Charlotte's Web, and The Trumpet of the Swan. Do you have a favorite? 
wow, they're each so good. It's like saying, which is, which is your favorite dog? Which is your I, favorite child? Yeah, yeah I know. <laughs> they're so good for each for different reasons. But I'm going to say Charlotte's Web. Okay. Because it has a universal theme and it's pitch perfect that every word in that book feels to me like, I don't know if you have snow where you live, but when you're walking along and you have these the first snow of winter and the snowflakes start to fall and they land quietly and perfectly. And that's what that book feels like to me. It's like snow on a path and the first snow on a path in the winter. It's just, yeah, I, I mean, I wondered, I wish he were alive for me to ask, how did it feel to him when it was done? Did he know what a masterpiece it was? He must have had some sense that he had gotten it right or yeah. gotten it, you know, pitch perfect, I think. You know, it's funny because I was a voracious reader as a child and I don't remember a lot of books that I read or I don't have specific memories. You know, I can look at a book and go, I remember reading that as a kid, but I don't remember actually reading it. I remember where I was sitting when I read Charlotte's Web for the first time. It was, I remember thinking I have just encountered something different than other things that I've encountered before. As an adult, I think Trumpet of the Swan is my favorite. And I don't know, I was trying to think of why is that? I think his characterizations in that book, like the father swan, I just, it made me, makes me laugh out loud every time I think of the Louis' father just starting to talk. <laughs> Um, yeah. His characters are so well, I mean, they are in all of his books, but the Trumpet of the Swan holds a special place in my heart. When I read it to my kids a few years ago, it must have been about five years ago, we actually went and saw Trumpeter Swans that were living in a nature reserve near us. And it just took the book to a whole new level. Yeah. That is really fantastic. Yeah. Trumpet of the Swan, to my mind, it represents that journey he took from from his home in Mount Vernon, New York to Seattle after he left college because he went to Billings, Montana. He took a little side trip up to Canada. And I'm not sure if that's the trip he saw trumpeter swans because he I'm sure they were there. The impetus for the story was from a New York Times article on trumpeter swans. But I love that too. It definitely feels like a journey into another place for that for Sam Beaver, the main character. It's pretty special. Well, yeah. I live in the Northwest. I live in Spokane, right. Washington, which is eastern, you know, uh, several hours east of Seattle. But that's where we saw the trumpeter swan. So I wonder if it was uh -huh. when he was up here. Maybe that's the real reason why when I read that story, it feels like home to me. That could make a lot of sense, actually. <laughs> yes. Okay. And did you cry? When, oh, sorry. Did yeah. you cry when you read Charlotte's Web? I mean, oh, what yes. was that like for you when Charlotte died? I remember as a child feeling like this overwhelming sense of no, 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 and weeping at the same time, knowing it was just right, like that all was right with the world. Things are exactly how they're supposed to be. So it was wow. like this incredible sense of grief because you love her so much. And also at the same time, realizing there was something bigger going on that I wouldn't have been able to describe to you as a child, but I could definitely feel inside my bones. That's a beautiful thing you just said. That's really true. Yeah. Well, this has been such a treat. Before we go, I was wondering if you could talk to our young listeners who are aspiring writers, aspiring illustrators, and tell them or their parents some kind of advice or something that you could tell them as they continue on experimenting with words and art. Read. Read a lot or listen to books or be read to because there's something about the music of language that we absorb whether we know it or not. So even if like me or E.B. White even was not a great reader, there's still something about the language of words that's so delightful. And I listened to his books much more than I read them. So I, for three years, I listened to them incessantly. But so I would say that. And as far as making art, I have a wonderful quote on my studio wall by Alexander Calder. And it says that art should be happy and not lugubrious. And I think that's... <laughs> what does that mean? <laughs> I'm going to use that word. I don't even know what it means, but you're going to have to tell me now. <laughs> you can tell the context what it means, right? Yeah, so not heavy or sad. And I think that it's true in making art and in viewing art and in surrounding ourselves with art. So it's not, as kids, it's fun to go see art and, and make art and be immersed in it in all different ways. And bottom line, it should be a lot of fun, I think. 
Well, you're a very good model for that because we can just hear, like I said, we can hear the joy in you and you can see it when you're reading your books, enjoying your books, just the playfulness of your work. So thank you so much for this new book. Thank you for all of your work and thank you for coming to chat with me today. Thank you so much, Sarah. Now it's time for Let the Kids Speak. This is my favorite part of the podcast, where kids tell us about their favorite stories that have been read aloud to them. Hello, my name is Ruthie. I am nine years old, and I live in Don, Montana, USA. And my favorite book is Daniel Pinkwater, Snarkart Boys in the Avocado of Death. I like it because it's really funny, and some of the guys in there say really funny things. Like the main character in the book's name is Walter, and he is telling the story officially, and he makes a speech in this park that is in his town called, his town's name is Bakingburg, and he makes this speech in Blueberry Park, and he ends with, school stinks. It is really funny. Another reason that I like it is because Walter and his friend, Winston Bongo, whose uncle is the white gorilla who is a wrestling Brian Tangs, that is a kind of monkey. He, a lot of the guys in there say really fun things, and they capture the book criminal Wallace Nussbaum for trying to get rats on the hole. My name is Nora. I am seven years old and from Dillon, Montana, and I like The Princess and the Goblin by George MacDonald, and the reason I like it is because it's just delightfully scary. It's really fancy and stuff like that. So, bye! Hello, my name is Killian. I'm five. My favorite book is Red Wall by Brian Jack. And I like it because the bell pal fell on the bell pal fell on creepy skirt. Goodbye. <laughs> What's your name? Ozzy. And how old are you? Me? Three. Three. And what's your favorite book? Of course, the bird book. Is it the Bird Guide to Oklahoma? What's your favorite thing about the book? I love purple and purple and evil here. What's your favorite bird? And my favorite bird is. What's your favorite bird? The chickadee. Oh yes, this. And my favorite bird. The scarlet tan summer tanager. Can you say summer tanager? Summer tanager. What's your name? Katie. And how old are you? Five. And what's your favorite book? Beauty and the Beast. And who's it by? Dan Brett? Dan Brett. And what is what do you like about this book? About the pictures and the flowers and the girls and the decorations on them. Hi, my name is Isaiah. I'm almost eight. I live in Nepal. My favorite book is The Wing Feather Saga, and my favorite of all of them is The Fourth. Hi, I'm Ezekiel. I'm five, and I live in Nepal. I love Abby Pirate Story because it has lots of dogs, and I like it. Hi, my name is Caroline. And I'm seven years old, and I'm from Park City, Utah. And one of my favorite stories is Miss Rapp Scott's School for Girls. And the reason I like it is it because it's very funny. It's by Elise Primavera. Hi, my name is Phoebe, and I'm nine years old, and I'm from Park City, Utah. And one of my favorite books is Beezus and Ramona by Beverly Cleary. I really like it because Ramona is so naughty. My name is Egan. I'm eight years old and I live in Dillon, Montana. Now my favorite book is The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe by C.S. Lewis. The reason I like it is that it was the first book about Narnia ever written. The children make friends with the beavers and they meet Aslan, the great lion, and they kill the white witch. Oh man, okay, you've got to hear this message too. This came in from one of our Read Aloud Revival moms and it made my heart sing. Hi Sarah, my name is Erin. I'm from Park City, Utah. I have eight children, very similar in ages to yours, and I even have twins. 
twin boys right at the end, just like you do. So often when I am listening to the podcast, I can relate to all that you are talking about. And I just wanted to thank you for all you and the Read Aloud Revival team for all that you do, because I started listening to you last summer when my sister-in-law told me about you. And I was at a point where I felt very discouraged about homeschooling and feeling like I just want to give up. And I started listening and you and the guests that you have and the advice and the tips and the ideas are such a great motivator and they have kept me going on many a dark day. So thank you so much. Kids, thank you so much for those messages. That's my favorite part of the podcast. And Erin, thank you especially for your note that completely made my day. Now listen, if your kids would like to leave a message to be aired on the Read Aloud Revival, head to readaloudrevival.com, scroll to the bottom of the page, and you'll find out exactly how to do it. It's very easy. Do you want to get Melissa Sweet's new book, Some Writer, The Story of E.B. White? You'll find a link to it in the show notes. Just head to readaloudrevival.com and you'll see it there as a bonus episode in season nine. In the show notes, we'll also have links to some resources that will help you as you introduce your kids to the work of E.B. White. That's Stuart Little, Charlotte's Web, and The Trumpet of the Swan. All of E.B. White's books are perfectly suited for reading aloud. That's not really something you can say about most authors, but if you want to take those books to the next level with your kids, head to our show notes at readaloudrevival.com and you'll find links to great resources that will help you do just that. Next up for Melissa Sweet is a book she's illustrating that was written by the award-winning author Kwame Alexander. I cannot wait to see it. And um, hey, we'll be back next week since this was a bonus episode. So I'll see you next Tuesday right here on the Read Aloud Revival. Don't forget to go to rarmembership.com. Pop your email in there if you want to know what's coming right around the bend here at the Read Aloud Revival. It's going to be a great time. See you soon. Until then, go build your family culture around books. Thank you.